Yeah, now it's about time to talk about big O and K nearest neighbors runtime complexity. So big O is a notation or a concept in computer science that is used to analyze the efficiency of algorithms. So usually that refers to the runtime complexity in terms of the execution speed, but then also um, with a focus on how it behaves asymptotically if we have a very large data set. Sometimes big O notation is also used to uh, analyze the memory efficiency, so how much memory is required. So if you think back of what I showed you in the very beginning of lecture two, the training step of k nearest neighbors is um, yeah, simply saving the training data set. And that itself can be very expensive. So saving the training data set can require a large amount of RAM, so computer memory, or if we keep it on the hard drive, um, yeah, hard drive storage space. Hard drive storage spa space has become, has become cheaper over time. Um, but yeah, depending on how we implement the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, it may require that we hold all the data points in, in memory. And if we have a large data set, let's say millions of images, then this can be quite a limiting factor. But right now let's more focus on uh, runtime complexity that means uh, how fast k and n is in the prediction step. So first, for those who have not heard about it, let's briefly introduce big O or big O notation. So here I'm just listing uh, several functions that uh, are used for yeah, basically describing how efficient an algorithm is. So we could also maybe extend this list and call this column notation and then we have a big O of 1, O of log n and so forth. And we usually use these functions here to denote yeah, the, the complexity or the runtime of other functions. So these are the common ones that are usually used in the context of big O. Um, I will show you a concrete example uh, how to find out the runtime complexity of certain functions in a few moments. But yeah, uh, I will also on Canvas, if you have not heard about Big O before, post some reading material, um, some introductory reading material about Big O. There's also something called Big Theta and Big Omega, so they are related concepts. So maybe it would uh, not hurt to read about this in a, I would say, more detailed tutorial, because in this class, we don't focus that much on computer science. It's just that we use Big O here right now to understand the k nearest neighbor algorithm. So in this table, I'm sorting also um, the functions from lowest runtime complexity to highest runtime complexity. So that means uh, yeah, the, the higher up the function is on the list, the better, the faster it would execute, for example. So what we have is, uh, just to maybe briefly go over it, we have a constant one. So constant means no matter how big my data set is, um, this function would never um, become more expensive if n increases. So we, we usually look at the case where n approaches infinity. So if this grows really, really large, let's say infinitely large, how would my function behave? A constant function wouldn't be affected by that at all. So it would execute at the same or in the same manner. And that is the ideal case scenario. So functions like that, that are that fast um, and not affected by the number of data points, let's say in machine learning, that would be awesome. But of course, it's usually not realistic. Uh, logarithmic uh, is also pretty good still. Linear is also still pretty good, but of course not good as good as logarithmic. Then we have log linear growth. It's a bit slower than linear, but again, not bad. Uh, where it becomes bad or what people kind of start consider as not ideal is everything, let's say, um, starting with quadratic or beyond. So quadratic, cubic, or higher level polynomial complexity, and especially exponential complexity, that's usually considered very bad. And in this case, um, it's not ideal to use such algorithms for very large data sets. Yeah, to get a more visual impression of how the runtime complexity looks like, as a function of n, I made a plot here. So on the x-axis, uh, that's 
uh, n, the size of the data set, and f of n is um, yeah, basically the complexity of the algorithm. So basically what happens if I plug in n into, into the function here. So as you can see, uh, if we are at the very low end here, around two, it doesn't really matter which algorithm we use, it's about the same uh, runtime. So we can also maybe um, yeah, consider this as a time that it takes to run the algorithm, not just only the output of the function, but really like a runtime. So the higher, the worse, and uh, the lower, the better, of course. So we can see as we increase n, certain functions um, become increasingly, increasingly bad. Um, it's hard to see how well the quadratic one is doing because we are really here at a very small level still. And um, also we have a large scale. So the scale is not really zoomed in into this area here. So it's kind of hard to see how really, how really expensive the quadratic already is. But what we can see is that something like cubic becomes really bad really fast. And then especially this um, exponential one, it is like exploding very soon, even with small numbers. So usually we want to really avoid exponential growth in machine learning in terms of the data set size. So to explain a little bit more about how we get from a certain, let's say, function to the big O notation of that function, uh, I'm providing an example here. So this is a simple function, a quadratic, quadratic function. And this would basically reduce to a big O complexity of x squared, so quadratic. The reason is that we usually only look at the dominant term. So the dominant term is the one that grows the fastest. In this case, it would be um, this term here, because uh, and like we've seen in the previous slide, comparison to this term, the growth of uh, this one and this one is really negligible. So these are so small that, let's say, in, um, they are so small if we go to n infinity that we can just ignore them. And then also it doesn't really matter whether we have 14 times x squared or just x squared when we go um, with n really large, it's, it will be both really large numbers. So usually we also would drop this and just focus on on the um, x here. So that is how we would get the big O notation of this function. So let's take a look at a different function now. Yeah, so like you saw in the previous slide, scaling factors are usually dropped when we do the or when we derive the big O notation. So in the, uh, for this example, might be useful if you pause the video for now and um, just maybe try to solve it yourself. And then I will give you the solution in three seconds. Yeah, so again, like in the previous slide, the solution would be, um, or we would be focusing on the dominant terms. So we would be dropping this term here and this factor here and just focus on the x. So we have x log, and then again, this is negligible. If we go from x, or we, if we consider x to be infinitely large, or as x grows infinitely large. So in this case, what we would have here, what would remain is x log x. So again, yeah, dropping the non-dominant terms, focusing on the dominant terms here, and that would be log linear growth in that case. Ah, yeah, so one additional note. Um, I wrote x log x and not x log 2x. So I have the natural log logarithm instead of um, the logarithm with basis 2. And it's because it doesn't really matter which one we use. So we, um, we don't really distinguish between different logarithms. We usually just use the natural logarithm. And uh, yeah, why is that? I mean, if you think about uh, transforming the base of a logarithm, for example, if I go from log two to let's say uh, the log of basis 10 or the log with basis 10, how I would write that is simply log 10 of x divided by log 10 of should be two, right? So I could express it like as follows. And then you can see if I just rewrite this as um, one over log 10 
two times log 10 x. You can see the x is inside here. So here in this term, there's no x really involved. So it's just a scaling factor. So we can just drop this scaling factor. And now I have uh, log 10 of x here. So um, for the big O notation, but of course I can do that with any basis. So I can also use the um, natural logarithm. So I can just drop the 10 here. So we have a natural logarithm now. Some people write the natural log logarithm also as ln, but in this class we will just use log for the natural logarithm, which is more common. So I can also do this, and then the uh, big O notation for this function here would be x log x, right? So in that case, we don't have to worry about the basis of the logarithm. You can just simply ignore that as well. Yeah, instead of giving you another boring symbolic function, I thought I would give you a Python function here to explain um, big O notation, or just to show you an example, a concrete example of applying big O notation to a computational algorithm. So here I implemented matrix multiplication, a function for matrix multiplication between two matrices A and B. Um, and this is a very in, uh, inefficient way to do a matrix multiplication in Python. And I was just doing this intentionally because next lecture, I'm going to show you a more efficient way of doing that. The point here really is not the efficiency of this matrix multiplication. It's more about um, just having a function so that we can look at the big O complexity or the runtime complexity of this function. So let's maybe walk through this function step by step. So what am I doing here? So again, the inputs to this function are these two matrices, um, A and B. So I'm actually calling it here. So um, I'm calling the matrix function, multiplication function here. So the inputs are A and B, the two matrices, and there will be an output matrix C. So C, that's what's getting returned here is my output matrix. So I'm just, setting it up uh, in the beginning so that we have a matrix of zeros and then we populate the matrix with the values. So um, as you may know, if we multiply two matrices, um, we have, let's say, a matrix um, M times P, or let's, let's just use the concrete numbers. We have a matrix A with dimensions um, two times three. And then the second matrix is three times two, right? So three rows, one, two, oops, one, two, three, two columns. So the output dimension would be output dimension would be two times two, right? So this would be my output dimension. So I'm just setting it up here. So here, sorry, here in this block, I'm setting up my output matrix. It will be then a matrix of two times two. Because here I'm doing this, I'm iterating, I'm putting a zero for each row in uh, length A. So because I'm using a Python list here, the length of A is two because um, this list has two sublists. So um, each row is a sublist, sublist one, sublist two. So this will be giving me a list of two. And then for each column, I will um, do the same thing here for each column in B. So again, this will evaluate to two. So I will have a two by two matrix. This looks a little bit complicated. This is called list. Oops. I hate it when it happens. <laughs> list comprehension. This is called list comprehension. Okay, so but the focus is not really here on creating the output. It's um, it's important, but uh, we can see that here we have two for loops, whereas here we have three for loops. So the majority of the time in this function will be spent will be spent here, right? So not, not, in, not in here. So let's see uh, how we carry out the uh, actual matrix multiplication. So what I'm doing here is for each row in 
my matrix A. So I'm iterating first over the rows. So I'm starting with the first row. And then let's say for the first row, which is one, two, three, right? For the first row, then I'm going through the columns in B. So the columns in B um, are these and these. So now let's say we consider the first column, five, six, seven. So that's where we are right now. We have this first row and this first column. And then I'm saying for each column in A, so I'm now iterating through columns here. So we are, let's say, still in the first iteration. We're iterating over columns. I'm adding the existing value in C. We start with the value zero, right? So that would be the value zero. And then we multiply between the first column and the first value. So the first column here and the first value in my um, in, in this column here. So I'm basically updating it like this, right? So I'm multiplying one times five, and then I'm putting one times five here to update the first value. So next we would uh, look at the lower end or the deepest for loop to complete the deepest for loop first, so which is this one. So again, we we said we iterate over call A, which is um, the position in um, the column position in in this row here in the first row still, and we use that call A here and here. Oh, sorry, here and here. So we use that before to compute one times five, and then update the position zero. Now what we do is um, I should maybe say now the value here would be five after the first update. Now what we do is we advance one more position, but again, because we use it here and here, we also advance this position here. So we are at six now. So the second update would be one times six, which is six. And we add this is the addition here. We add it to the previous result again. So this should be updated now and should be 11 and so forth. And we would yeah, complete this. Um, and then after we completed this for loop with a third number here, we would um, go back completing this for loop and so forth. So once we've done that, we would get the re uh, this, this following result here. And if you have not followed it exactly how this Python function works, don't worry so much about it. That's not the point of this slide. The point of the slide is really the runtime complexity. So we would try to um, find what are the expensive parts here that depend on the input size. So in this case, what we have is we have three for loops. So these are the expensive for loops. Of course, we also have some for loops here, but there are only two nested for loops. So the really the expensive part is, is going to happen here. So if we think of matrices, uh, in this case, let's say uh, in case of um, quadratic matrices, like a quadratic shape, um, what we can see here is that we are iterating over the rows and over the columns and again over the columns of that row. So in that case, um, if we consider n the number of rows and the number of columns of this matrix, because there are three for loops, what we would find is that the runtime complexity of this function is n cubed. And as we've seen earlier in the plot, uh, n cubed, that's actually a pretty expensive algorithm. So in practice, we would never use such an algorithm here in practice. There are way more efficient way to do a matrix multiplication in Python. Yeah, so now the more interesting question. What is the runtime complexity of the k nearest neighbor algorithm. So if you think of the brute force search that we introduced in the beginning for the one nearest neighbor search, we are searching for k near neighbors. So we, we want to carry out the search k times. So we search for k neighbors. 
And in the brute force search, if we use the naive approach that we covered at the beginning of this lecture in the first video, we are looking at each training example. So we have uh, K neighbor, neighbors and we check each training example to do the distance computation. And the training data set, let's say we call that N. We have N training examples. So that depends on N. So if we have 100 training examples, we have to do 100 um, distance computations against the query points. And if we want to use K neighbors, or if you want to find K neighbors and we use a naive approach, we have to repeat this process um, K times, but there are more efficient way of doing that. But in the most simple case, it would be K times searching for the neighbor in the N sized training set. And then another factor is if you think back of the Euclidean distance, the distance depends on all the dimensions. So if we have a Euclidean distance uh, with a sum over where all the distances between, let's say some query point and some um, data point in the training set. So this is for one data point. This is, let's, let's call this I, the ith training point in the data set. We would have, of course, n times these computations. So if I have the Euclidean distance like that, this would depend on the dimensions. So if we have m dimensions, we would have the distance computation depending on m, the number of dimensions. So if I would then consider that, um, I would have k times n times m as my runtime complexity of a naive application of k nearest neighbors. Of course, um, k is usually very small. We usually use something like five or three, five, seven, ten, something like that. So in that case, maybe you can ignore that k here. And for m, I mean, usually also we have very large training sets and lower dimensions. So usually we have n, it's much bigger than m. So in that case, we maybe can also drop the m here. And in that case, what remains is um, the runtime complexity of n as the size of the training set. And that would be for the most naive implementation of the k nearest neighbor algorithm. Yeah, let us briefly think about how we can make k nearest neighbor algorithms more efficient. So maybe also that's a good point here to pause the video and to brainstorm a little bit and think about possible ways for making k nearest neighbors more efficient. And then maybe you can even take an hour, half an hour, go for a walk and think about it and come back later and continue this video. It's one of the advantage of having an online video compared to in-person classes. Um, and after, yeah, after you've done that, we will talk about some of the possible ways. So I'm intentionally leaving this part, this slide blank now. And in the following slides, I will show you again the naive K nearest neighbor implementation. Then I will show you one little trick. And in the following video, I will show you some more tricks. And maybe uh, if you thought about potential ways, your way may be different from what other people tried. And that would be then an excellent uh, class project or maybe even research project. So here is one naive way um, how we can implement the k nearest neighbor search. So I just call that naive, sorry, naive nearest neighbor search. Um, there are of course many different ways we can do that, but that's um, the, I would say most simple one I can think of. I call this variant A. I will show you in a next slide, another idea I had um, for implementing k nearest neighbors. So what's going on here? So first, I will start with a data set DK. So this is, um, I will start with an empty data set. So this will be the data set holding our k nearest neighbors. And then we implement a while loop. We say while the size of the set of the set DK here is smaller than k, then continue doing something. And that is finding a new neighbor that we can add to the set. So how do we find the neighbor? This is similar to what I've shown you in the very first video of lecture two. 
So we start out by setting the closest distance to infinity, and then we iterate over the training set for all the data points that we have not considered yet. So for the symbol here means for all i data points that are not contained in the set uh, dk. So what I do then is I compute the current distance between my query data point, that's the point I want to classify, and the ith data point in the training set. So the ith data point is what we are iterating, uh, iterating over. So we have n data points in the training set like always. And then we say if the current distance is smaller than the closest distance, we start with infinity, then we keep that point. So we consider it as a closest point. So after each loop here, let me use a different color, after each loop over the training set, we will find one neighbor that we haven't found before. So by each loop, we increase the size of dk until it reaches size k. So what we have is we have k times a for loop over the n training data points. So what would be the big O complexity of this? Maybe pause the video and think a little bit about this. Yeah, I hope this was pretty straightforward. So this would be kn because we look for k neighbors in the n-sized data set. That's one way of implementing k nearest neighbors. Here I thought about a different way for implementing k nearest neighbors. Um, I call that variant B. It's basically doing the same thing we did in the previous slide backwards. So I start with a subset DK, which is the whole training set. And again, while the length of DK is not equal to K, we do continue doing something. But instead of growing DK, like in the previous one, in the previous uh, slide, we said if DK is smaller than K, now I say if DK is greater than K. So what I'm doing now is I'm eliminating data points from this um, set dk until I reach my desired number of neighbors. So this, uh, because we eliminate, we start with um, yeah, the largest distance, setting it to zero, because we want to find the point that is the farthest away from our query point and remove that. So we set the largest distance to zero. And then again, for each data point in the training set, um, but also, again, we only consider the ones that are not already con uh, contained in, in the subset here. Oh, sorry, in this case, we are considering only the ones that are contained in the subset, because this is uh, what we want to eliminate. We don't want to consider points that we already eliminated in the previous round. So for all the data points in the subset, I compute again the current distance. So we compute the current distance. If the current distance is larger than the largest distance, in the first iteration, this will be, of course, true, because the largest distance will be likely larger than zero. Otherwise, it would be exactly the query point. If that's true, if we find a point that is larger away than the largest distance we already have, then we save that point, and then we remove it from dk. And we remove uh, points until the size um, of dk matches k. So I have a greater sign here. So if this is uh, true, so if k, uh, sorry, if the length of dk, if we want to find, let's say, five neighbors and the size of dk, oops, size of dk is six, then we would still meet this criterion here and then execute the last while loop. And in the last while loop, again, we remove one more data point. So after this while loop, dk will also be size five, and then we can stop. So what is the time complexity of this variant b? So what do you think? Yeah, so in this case, since we go backward, we start with n training data points, and then we eliminate, right? So we have n minus k, and then because we have a for loop, we have a for loop for each um, neighbor, that, or for each data point that we remove from our decay list, so it should be times n. 
So what would be the time complexity of this approach? That would be then n minus k, I should put this in parentheses, times n. So which one is more efficient, variant a or b? Of course, that depends on the size of um, k. So if we have a large k uh, compared to n, then of course um, variant b would be more efficient than a, but in all likelihood n is much, much larger than k. So in that case, I would say um, variant a is more efficient. Yeah, another idea I had is using a priority queue that can help us speeding up k nearest neighbor implementations. So in the previous two slides, variant A and variant B kind of suffered from the problem that we um, checked the training data set repeatedly, which can be wasteful, I think. So we could, for example, use a priority queue um, and kind of keep track of our nearest neighbors as we check the data set so we don't have to check it k times. Because yeah, in the previous slide, we basically selected one neighbor. Um, on let's say variant A, we selected one neighbor. And then once we selected it, we started all over again and did the same check over all n minus one data points to find the second neighbor. So what we could do is we could initiate a priority queue. So for example, if we are interested in k equals five neighbors, we could um, take the first, let's say, or just randomly, five data points in the training set and initialize a priority queue. For example, let's say we call it the data point x5, x, I don't know, x13, x4. Well, let's let's ch change this to k equals three, so I don't have to write that much. Um, let's say we found these five, uh, three random points and we can keep track of them as we check our training set. So when we iterate over our training set, we check for each data point in the training set, is it closer than this one? If yes, then we replace this point here with the point in the training set. If no, we check this one and say, okay, is this point closer to my query point than this given training point? If Yes, again, we swap it. Otherwise, we move on to the next one. And we say if this data point is closer to the current training point, um, then we swap this one with the current training data point. Otherwise, we, we continue up to the next training point. So in that way, um, we only have one sweep uh, through the training set. We don't do the n checks multiple times, right? So in that way, um, that can help us speeding up the k nearest neighbor search. And yeah, for this priority queue, we can use a data structure also, for example, a heap data structure to make this more efficient. And then this would eventually come down to something like um, log k times n. So we again have at least one time we really have to sweep over the whole training set, but we don't have to do it. We don't have to do a full sweep again in the next round for the k nearest neighbors. So I just set um, heap data structure. So what is a heap data structure? You don't really have to know this for this class really. This is like a computer science concept, a data structure in computer science. I will post a link on Canvas um, for further reading if you're interested. But really, you don't have to know what a uh, you don't have to know what a heap is for this class here. But no, if you're interested, uh, let me just quickly tell you what a heap is. So it's just a data structure for organizing a data set or an array, and it allows us to find certain points more efficiently. So let me uh, draw a binary heap. So it's kind of like a decision tree. Let's consider a toy data set. Let me you know, just pick some random numbers. I don't know, one, eight, six, five, nine, seven. So let's say I have an array like this. I would organize it into a heap data structure by starting, first I would basically construct the initial heap. So I would go put the first element at the root and then it's a binary data structure. So what I would do is I would take the second two elements, put them here, eight, and 
six. You can put the larger one to the left, for example, but usually we go just how the data or array is organized. Then I have a five and nine, so I start always on the left side. I'll just put the five here, the nine here, and the seven, the remaining one here. Because this is like an unorganized heap, so we would then in the next step um, yeah, sort this array. So how that works is, for example, I could all put all the largest values on top. And for that, I would do several swaps. So I would, for example, swap these two numbers. So six and a seven. So after swapping them, I will have the seven here and the six here. Um, and then I can use a different color. I can swap these two. And in one swoop, um, because nine is greater than eight, and eight is greater than one, so I can also swap these two here. So in one step, how that would look like after a swap, I would have the nine here, the one here, right? And the eight here. And then of course I can swap the one and the eight, right? So let me cancel or remove this so you can see what we currently have. And then the last step, I because eight is greater than one, I would swap these two. So in the end, I would then have the one down here, the eight up here. So the cleaned up version of the heap would be nine, eight, five, five here, one, seven, six. And this one allows me, for example, more efficiently to look up certain values more efficiency, uh, efficiently. So if I want to find the largest value, I would start on a root node. And then you can go through the heap basically and find uh, the largest value always basically um, to the left. So large, uh, the larger one is to the left. So here in this case, the eight, and then here the right side is the seven. And then for each root node, I have again like an organization where the larger value is to the left and the smaller value is to the right. And I just see, um, since we are interested in similarity and distance, it would actually be more useful to have a heap that is organized such that the smallest values are on top. So what I was just drawing is a max heap. We can also draw a min heap that would actually be more useful for nearest neighbor search with a priority queue. But again, this is like a detail you don't have to worry about in this class. I was just briefly going over the concept of a, uh, of a heap, I can just post some tutorial if you're interested in learning more about it. But again, you don't have to really understand how a heap works. So next, um, in the next video, I will make this a separate video. I will show you some more tricks for making k nearest neighbors more efficient. So the priority queue is like a nice idea, but the priority queue is also not super efficient compared to some other tricks that people usually use in practice.